Thank you for that introduction, Athena. Uh, I am Tom Solomon, and we're going to talk about climate solutions today. Um, this is what I'm going to cover. I'll start with a little overview of kind of the science, keying off of what Dr. Dubois talked about, uh, because really science sets the goals for what we need to achieve uh, as a climate solution. And I'll talk about technology and the economics, which is what's feasible. And then I'll talk about the politics, because what is holding us back is not technology, it's not a technology problem. What's holding us back is politics and the entrenched interests that are profiting so much off of the status quo, making money off of fossil fuel extraction and burning it. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some things that are happening here in the state of New Mexico. So, and um, I, uh, I packed about uh, two hours of slides into this 45-minute uh, talk, so forgive me if I skip over some things or just cover some of it quickly. So here we go. First, I want to deal with this topic, which is called climate grief. And so um, this is especially affecting young people. And I wouldn't be surprised, Dr. Dubois, if you were not encountered this, right, when you deal with uh, the details of what's going to happen to this planet over the coming um, years and decades and how bad it's going to get and how little we're doing to prevent it. Um, you know, responses like grief, depression, and despair are normal. Um, this is a presentation that was recently done in University of California, Santa Barbara, coming of age at the end of the world, talking to young people about what they're dealing with, understanding what's coming. So. Bill McKibben, uh, kind of our guru at 350.org, has a good quote here. It's only depressing and despairing if you think that you can't take on the problem. It's the greatest fight in human history whose outcome will reverberate for geologic time, and it has to happen right now. And for me, I work through my grief, and we as a community of uh, people concerned about climate change need to support each other and then resolve to fight to preserve the future in as livable form as we, we possibly can. And so, quote from Joan Baez, action is the best antidote for despair. So, science sets the goals. Let's talk about some science. We just looked at this chart. This happens to be one that was just published uh, in the last couple weeks, showing 2018 average. Um, the last five years were the hottest years on record. 2018 was about number four, um, but that is an unmistakable trend of warming. Um, and um, just to reiterate, uh, the cause is unmistakably the buildup of carbon dioxide as the primary greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. This is a trend going back 800,000 years, uh, long before modern humans evolved on the planet, which is about 200,000 years ago. Never got above 280 or so parts per million. Stayed in this relatively narrow band of you know, call it 170 to 280 parts per million of CO2 until recently, until the, um, the industrial age and really after World War II and accelerating in the last 30 years. So we are now today at 413 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere per the Keeling curve. And the forecast for the end of the century, uh, if we continue on the path that we're on, is up to a catastrophic level of possibly 900 parts per million, which would be the absolute end of human civilization on this planet. Impacts are being help, felt now in terms of wildfire and heat waves and drought and superstorms and famine and drought in the Middle East and wildfires in California and hurricanes uh, all over the United States in 2017. <clears throat> amounting up to uh, 400 to 500 billion dollars in economic damage for each one of those and more wildfires and more northeaster storms and then the campfire that happened in uh, northern California near the town of Chico. My daughter lives right there and she uh, was breathing the smoke from this fire this summer. It was choking and hard to survive and it wiped out a town of 27,000 people just wiped it off the map, um, and upwards of 88 people are dead, and they died in their homes uh, or in their cars trying to escape a fire that was just coming like a freight train. So that's what happened in California. Uh, we are setting heat records uh, every year. These are just some in the last, um, last 
summer, and uh, it got so bad in France that they had to shut down four nuclear reactors because the rivers that they used for cooling water were so hot that they couldn't use the cooling water uh, for their source of electric power. Uh, the Inter Information Institute uh, for the Insurance Industry tracks natural disasters, and they are showing that natural disasters are up by a factor of three since the 1980s, and they are all attributable to droughts and floods and storms that are things related to the climate. The, track, uh, the factors that they track related to geological events, those red bars in the bottom, and they are flat, not moving. And this is the Keeling curve that shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the past, uh, this goes back to the 1700s. And you know, we were in this relatively stable range um, in the high end of the 250 to 300 parts per million range of that accelerating, especially as the Industrial Revolution took off. Um, this is a measurement that's taken on the top of the Mauna Loa Observatory in the Hawaiian Islands where they got a nice clean signal. And uh, a couple days ago, we were at 413 parts per million. I'm showing you this because scientists often cite about 450 parts per million as the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will trigger a commitment planet-wide to about two degrees C of uh, total warming. Eventually, it takes about a decade or so after you reach that CO2 level before you get the full effects of that warming. But that's what we're headed towards. Um, enthusiastically, burning so much carbon uh, that we are headed right towards 450 parts per million by about 2035 on this schedule if you just do a simple extrapolation. So what we have to do as a species as a society in the United States is to stop burning uh, fossil fuels, stop burning, putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, bend that curve over before it gets to 450, and stabilize the climate before it reaches catastrophic levels. That is our mission. And um, some scientists uh, got together in um, the about 2011. I think National Academy of Sciences published this study called A Warming World. I brought a copy of it to my bag if you want to look at it. But they were forecasting what will happen to our ability to grow the major food crops that supports human civilization, like corn and soybean and rice, as the global temperature increases to one to two to three degrees Celsius. And you will see crop levels going down 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent at the same time when the global population is increasing from where are we at, seven point something billion people on the planet today to like nine billion people um, going forward. So at the same time our population is increasing, our ability to grow food to support that population um, and to um, allow those people to live is going to be degraded by increasing levels of drought and uh, heat waves and um, just uh, heat effects, so not a good scenario. So I have found, I've delivered a presentation like this 40 some times around the state, including to the state legislature to try to convince them to act. And I have found it useful to just condense all of the information that science tells us about what's coming from the IPCC reports, along with kind of the, the warming chart on this previous page, which you can infer from some of the IPCC reports about when on our current uh, worst case scenario we might hit some of these levels. And so this is the commentary I put together by decades through the 2060s. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, RCP 8.5, 8 uh, from the IPCC, this is the kind of scenario that we would be living through as a species. Our children will live through this world. This red line here is kind of what we are already committed to. Um, there is so much CO2 in the atmosphere right now that there is no way to avoid warming getting to somewhere between 1 and 2 degrees C. Even if we stopped emitting all carbon today, it would stabilize somewhere in that level. But every year we keep emitting more CO2, that red line keeps marching down another year and another year and another year. And you know, we will see in the 2030s major food shortages of corn and wheat, increasing levels of extreme weather uh, on, a, on a really high tide day. Uh, on a king tide, you might see it in downtown Miami, one meter underwater. 
That is the worst case scenario. In the 2040s, if we get to two degrees C or more, crop yields globally down by 30%. Most summers will be hotter than the European heat wave of 2003 that killed upwards of 30,000 people just in Europe. Uh, that will happen worldwide every summer. It'll be much worse in China and India and Africa and uh, South America. Um, mountain ecosystems dying 30% of all species of life on Earth at risk of permanent extinction. Permanent extinction. Beginnings of extension, extensive starvation. If we ever get to three degrees, God help us, 40 to 70% of all species are going extinct. Amazon and boreal forests will start to die back, which means they are no longer um, a carbon sink. They're no longer absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing it as, as oxygen. They're dying and then releasing their CO2 stored in their trees and their plant matter back into the atmosphere, making it worse. And you'll begin to see the release of carbon dioxide and frozen methane into the permafrost, which is an enormous sink of stored frozen carbon, uh, tripling from one and a half degrees C. Uh, resource wars, um, climate migration wars are inevitable. Uh, millions of people will be moving from areas that are no longer habitable, looking to come into your living room. Um, and just think what's happened with Syrian refugees, which are maybe on the order of a million people, have destabilized a lot of Europe. Uh, we're talking about tens and tens of millions of climate refugees under the scenario. And in the 2060s, if we get to 4 degrees C, a lot of scientists have predicted that the ability to grow food and all of these other climate effects will support less than a million people on planet Earth, and it's pretty much game over for human civilization. So let's not do that. And I've presented this many times, and you know, you talk about the solutions and the, the changes that we have to go through, and <clears throat> People ask, well, really, do we have to do this? Do we have to make these changes? And my answer to them is to think about your children living in this world and looking back at us today, saying, what should we be doing today to prevent this future, to prevent them from living through that? And so put that in that context. Sorry. So our, the IPCC report really sets the goal that I think has to be our goal heard this meme come out, we have 12 years left. What that 12 years means is that we have 12 years to cut the carbon dioxide emissions worldwide by 50%, 50% from about 40 gigatons a year down to about 20 gigatons by 2030, and then to zero net carbon emissions by 2050. That has to be our goal. That is, in fact, the stretch goal for um, the Paris climate change. Minutes? Okay. You're, yeah, you're 30 minutes. Okay. Left. So, if we don't do that, this is what we face. Simultaneous climate disasters that are just unimaginable. So let's not do that. So what we have to do instead is urgently mobilize, convert our energy system away from fossil fuels towards carbon-free renewable energy, starting with renewable electricity and then renewable transportation, and then attacking the industrial and agricultural sector. So let's talk about technology and economics. Uh, we covered a bit of this before. This is a chart from 2013 for just the US, different from worldwide because we're an industrialized nation. Um, the major emissions 2013 was the electric power sector, about 40% of all carbon dioxide, about a third of the pie transportation, the rest of it, uh, industrial, commercial, agriculture, et cetera. And from the electric power sector, three fourths of that coming from burning coal, about a quarter of it from burning natural gas. So it made sense to uh, address the electric power sector as the highest priority, which has been done. And the Sierra Club and others have led very important campaigns to shut down coal-fired power plants as they are the biggest point sources of CO2 emissions. This is a little bit later study and shows a little bit more detail from the EPA in 2016. I'm just gonna focus on this bottom chart. So. If you look at the, the emissions of greenhouse gases, they're 82% carbon dioxide. About 10% of the effect is coming from methane, 6% on nitrous oxide, and other fluorinated gases, 3%. Now these fluorinated gases, some of them have, um, have uh, 
multiples of uh, warming impacts in the tens of thousands versus a, a molecule of carbon dioxide. So that's one reason why you'll see later on that refrigerant gases, like in your refrigerator, the CFCs that they use in, in refrigerators need to be very tightly controlled and improving our release of those kinds of gases is very important. For the um, sectors of our economy that emit greenhouse gases, 28% uh, from transportation, 28% uh, from electricity, industry, and others on the rest of it. So you can see over the course of three years, we really uh, shrunk down the impact from the electricity sector dramatically, um, and that's a good thing. So that's what we have to do. And another thing that I get faced with in doing this presentation is, you know, what about the industrial effects of, uh, you know, building all of these solar panels and wind turbines, and isn't that going to cause a carbon footprint? Well, compared to what? Compared to the impact that we're having on our natural world by what fossil fuel extraction does to our planet today. And so all of this stuff, all of these effects go away in a 100% renewable energy world, and that's a good thing. So where does electricity come from, right? Big power plants burning either coal or natural gas primarily, uh, send the electric power over the big high tension lines to a substation um, near your house and then over lower power lines to your, uh, to your home or your business. What's happening today, thankfully, is we are starting the conversion of these big power plants towards renewable energy like solar and wind and geothermal and hydroelectric, and we need to be shutting down these big emitters and converting to clean renewable energy. I think I'm gonna skip this one. So um, I wanna point you to a really great resource uh, if you wanna dig more into this. Um, Stanford University, Mark Jacobson, and the Climate Energy Program at Stanford has done marvelous work over the last, um, oh, five years or so, and um, aided by um, the Hulk, Mark Ruffalo, uh, the actor in helping to publicize it. So they have done an analysis of every country in the world and every state in the union in terms of what its 100% renewable energy future would look like based on the renewable sources that are available within that state uh, because you know the, the northeast and the northwest, lots of rainfall, lots of hydroelectric, uh, the Southwest has got lots of sun, uh, lots of offshore wind on the coast. It's different depending upon where you live. And so the mix of renewable energy for New Mexico at 100% renewables is a lot of solar. It's about 40% solar. It's about 50% wind. And it's about 10% geothermal in the state, which has a pretty good set of geothermal resources that could be developed if we do it. And they analyze how much it can cost, what the reduction in energy demand looks like, uh, what healthcare savings you, you will realize, what the <coughs> land use footprint is, which is surprisingly small, um, and the average energy cost, money in your pocket. Great analysis, great infographics for every state, every country. Great resource, thesolutionsproject.org. Highly recommend it. Um, and so, once we convert to 100% renewable electricity as our generation source, then we need to have all of the consumption sources to be purely electrified because we are currently burning gasoline in our cars, we're burning um, natural gas in our furnaces to heat our homes or to boil our hot water in the hot water heaters. All of those uh, sources of CO2 emissions have to be electrified if we want to go to 100% renewable energy world. So. This is kind of a timeline um, put together by Mark Jacobson, uh, via another great uh, writer uh, called Dave Roberts, who uh, writes on Vox, if you want to follow him. So we got to electrify heating and drying and cooking in the residential sector. Um, all new ships and ports uh, need to be electrified, new vehicles, uh, trains, buses, heavy duty trucks, uh, small marine vehicles. And it'll take a while, but there are solutions available for aircraft. There are already electric uh, planes in the sky being developed on a small scale, and they will expand as batteries get better for other sources of portable non-carbon fuels are available. And towards the 2040s, we need to be converting all of those to electrification or at least sustainable uh, power. 
So that's kind of a view of how you get to a, to a, a carbon neutral world. A factor that is tremendously in our favor as we make this conversion is the dramatic reduction in cost that we've been seeing for both solar and wind over the past decade. This is over the past nine years. Wind costs have dropped by 69%. Uh, solar costs have dropped by 88% over the last nine years on an unsubsidized basis. This is from um, a banking company in France called Lazard, and they do this great analysis every year published it in November, so this is last November's data. Unsubsidized costs, uh, onshore wind is now the cheapest form of new electricity followed by solar energy, cheaper than coal, competitive with natural gas. In New Mexico, because of the great position that we're in with so much sunlight and wind, cheaper than natural gas. And um, a response to this uh, complaint that you'll often hear, what happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? Well. Uh, they are complementary, and it turns out if you add a lot of solar and a lot of distributed wind over a lot of geographic area, um, you will get uh, combined curves that show, of course, solar energy peaks during the daytime, but it turns out that wind peaks at night, and it peaks in the winter, and sun, the solar peaks in the summer. So you add these two things together, and you get a curve that <coughs> largely, with some variations, uh, follows the load uh, during the course of the day. So with solar plus wind plus a bit of geothermal, which is a baseline resource, uh, and some uh, demand response and maybe some battery storage, you could get to 100% renewable energy world. And it's many, many studies by the National Renewable Energy Laboratories and others have shown this to be the case. Uh, the land footprint of 100% clean renewable energy is tiny. Uh, it is about four-tenths of 1% of the land area in the United States would be um, taken up by just renewable energy. So, um, of course, rooftop solar um, is at 7% is on existing roofs that are already covering the land anyway. The biggest new footprint is photovoltaics and concentrated solar uh, uh, solar thermal to be about 38% or 0.31% of the United States. Onshore wind um, is that tiny little red dot if you just count where the tower meets the ground, right? And of course you can do ranching and farming and lots of other things in between wind turbines. Um, the, the footprint counting spacing is that larger tan circle, but if you're just looking at the footprint of the where the Turbines actually disturb the earth, it's that little dot. And offshore wind would be a big contributor, but no land footprint for offshore wind. So it is a small issue. This is another great chart published by the Solutions Project. So the land footprint of renewable energy is not really a concern. Yes? Well, not, uh, just to make a point, you say that 0.4% of U.S. land area would be used for renewable energy. So the sizes of those circles are not representative of the amount of land relative to the size of the United States. Probably not, although that's his chart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that's yeah. a little misleading. It's a, li it's a yeah. little looks a little bit more than 24 percent. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, Amory Levins from the Rocky Mountain Institute has done some great videos. I highly recommend this five-minute video. It's called. The Myth of Storage Necessity, it's on YouTube, worth five minutes of your time. I've, I've watched it like 20 times because there's, it's just packed with good information. And he shows how the daytime, nighttime load can be matched um, with 100% renewable energy if you put wind and solar and some geothermal and energy storage and smart charging electric vehicles and all these things together. And when is a lot of storage needed? Well, um, not yet on the grid to get to 100% renewables. This is a study out of Australia, and they said you really don't need significant additional grid storage um, until you get 40 to 50% uh, penetration of renewable energy on the grid. So we're not there yet. On um, the bill that just passed today in the New Mexico State Legislature, we are scheduled to get to 50% renewables in 2030 for electricity. So that gives us, you know, 11, 11 years to figure this out and the cost curve for batteries is going down like 20% a year. They're already building utility scale 
uh, battery farms, it'll be ready in time, it'll be ready next year. So how do we pay for it? How about if we just cut the fossil fuel subsidies to zero, uh, which are, they're getting trillions of dollars worldwide every year. This is a study uh, came out just very recently uh, from a couple of Australian universities in conjunction with some German uh, organizations that showed uh, you can pay for the entire conversion to 100% renewable energy with about a quarter of the spending that we currently give to fossil fuels. So another great source of solutions is called Drawdown. So Drawdown, I bought the book, um, is a uh, publication, um, yes I did. So a uh, guy named Paul Hawken uh, got um, uh, you know, hundreds of PhD scientists together around the world and published this book, came out, I want to say 2017, and it's the 100 most important, uh, most significant solutions to climate change. Um, you get it, read it, it's great stuff. They have a website, they also have a pod podcast, which you can listen to, which is also fun. And they published, uh, with a lot of good uh, backup studies, the 100 most important solutions to getting to drawdown. Drawdown is not just uh, stabilizing our com concentration at you know 413 parts per million it's getting back below 350 which is the level that it takes to uh, have, a <coughs> have a sustainable future and so they show the solution the sector that it's in the amount of gigatons of carbon reduction the cost of the savings and um, I'm not going to go through a lot of details I'll just give you a taste of them we talked about refrigerant management because of the, those chlorinated gases are so potent in terms of their warming impacts, that's number one. Wind turbines, reducing food waste, converting worldwide to a plant-rich diet, uh, taking care of our tropical forests, and in the third world as a way of controlling population growth, educating girls um, and giving, uh, empowering them to make their own decisions and family planning is really important. A solar farm, silvopasture is a technique for uh, agriculture where you intersperse trees and agricultural crops together, etc. Draw down. Those are solutions 1 through 15. This is 16 through 20. In this grouping, you start to see transportation starting to show up as a category and breaking them apart into different kinds of vehicles. They're small individually, but if you add them up, um, they grow a lot. So electric vehicles have been growing dramatically uh, in the world, especially in China, who is incentivizing um, uh, their population to convert because their pollution is killing them. Uh, growth of sales in 2018 in China was 78%, 81% last year, primarily due to one vehicle, the Tesla Model 3. And this is what the U.S. growth looks like, and that's what the breakdown uh, looks like of all of those vehicles uh, sold in 2018. Um, and so uh, EV sales are growing in excess of 50% per year for the last three or four years in a row. And at this rate, there will be such an impact on demand for gasoline that the oil sector is going to be really significantly impacted, including here in New Mexico. So we better get ready as a New Mexico economy for the um, dramatic reduction and the bust in the oil sector because it's coming right at us within five to 10 years. Um, and people aren't acknowledging it, but it's going to happen because of that. Battery costs are dropping 20% per year, um, which is uh, fueling, so to speak, the advent and the acceleration of growth of electric vehicles, but also enabling utility scale batteries to be built. Uh, battery storage, in fact, <coughs> has already started to replace um, natural gas fired power plants that were planning to be built. Three of them are in California, were canceled within the last year. This is last November. Um, and it's starting to happen all over, and it needs to happen on an accelerated basis. There is going to be a replacement. Um, power plant being built in the Farmington area to replace the San Juan coal-fired power plant that is closing down in 2022. Uh, battery plus solar is a perfect storage uh, solution for that, for that place. 
We will also need a smart grid in order to integrate all of these variable renewable energy sources, the battery storage, the smart charging of electric vehicles, demand response, all of that stuff. This is a study, I think, University of Michigan, yeah, estimated that building out a smart grid would cost about $24 billion a year for 20 years. So, just something that you gotta do. There is also technology um, being developed and available for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, my stance is that a tree is the best way to remove CO2 in the atmosphere, or improved agriculture using, um, you know, replanting forests is the best way to do it. There is technology, uh, there's a company called Climeworks in Switzerland, but the scale of what you'd have to build to take, uh, build enough mechanisms to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere at the scale you're talking about is on the order of trillions and trillions of dollars of spending. We should be spending that money on deploying solar and wind as fast as we possibly can first before we even consider diverting those resources to carbon removal. So let's talk about politics. Uh, Michael Mann is a climate scientist. I'm sure you know Michael Mann. University of Pennsylvania, I think. Um, somebody asked him on Twitter. He's got a great Twitter feed. Um, if you had to pick only one thing, whether it be policy or technology, to solve climate change, what would you choose as being most effective? Hold our policymakers accountable for climate-friendly policies through every form of leverage available in a democratic society. Vote in every elective election. Hold your elected rep representatives responsible and demand that they act urgently to save your future. That is the most important thing that we can all do. Also this, do what you can to be more energy efficient. Convert to LEDs, buy an electric vehicle as your next car. Um, efficient appliances, go solar, adjust your thermostat. Spread the word that 100% renewable energy is doable. It's affordable, healthier, and creates good jobs. Support groups fighting climate change. If you've got a 401k, call up your advisor and say, I don't want to invest in carbon uh, extraction anymore. Um, sell all of my oil stocks. It's not only a good thing for the planet, it's also a good thing to do for your portfolio because <laughs> within a decade or so, all of those fossil fuels are going to be worth zero. Look at this free financial advice. Yes, <laughs> you heard it here first. 86% of people support more clean energy if you do polling. So the public understands this, they want more solar, they want more wind, it is tremendously bipartisan. Um, by seven to one, uh, it's as popular as eating thir uh, turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> they don't want more drilling, nuclear fracking, coal mining, they want solar and wind. 69% in a recent poll in December are very <coughs> worried about global warming. Um, and you can see the trend is increasing from like about 50% 10 years ago up to the high 60s percents now. And as these things go into the headlines, as we see these uh, reports saying we have 12 years left, as we get, um, you know, the town of uh, uh, Paradise in Chico, California, wiped off the map due to wildfires, uh, people are starting to get it. 28 people dying in a tornado in Alabama. Yep, yep, it's happening. And of course, the young people who will be living with the worst of these effects get it the most. Right, this is the age segment. The level of worry about global warming increases as it should. Um, the younger you get, but if we love our children, we should all be worried. And this is exit polls from 2018. Uh, the younger you get, the more they vote for people who believe in science and acting on the planet. Unfortunately, young people don't turn out to vote in the same numbers as the older people. That don't care, and so uh, the you know we're talking in presidential election years, uh, turnouts in the 40 to 50 percent range for 18 to 29 years old, versus the 65 to 70 percent range from uh, older people. So, if young people want to survive, this is the thing to fix. Unfortunately, fortunately, it started to change in the midterms in 2018, dramatic increase in, in young people turnout. If this trend continues, young people can get whatever they want. Young people can get whatever they want if they just turn out to vote. 
And this is what it looks like. You know, it spikes in presidential year, goes back down, and spikes in presidential year, goes down for all age ranges, but especially. So the Paris Climate Accords in December 2015 was a landmark achievement worldwide. Um, all the countries got together in Paris and committed to limit the global temperature increase this century to less than two degrees Celsius, trying to keep it to uh, no more than one and a half degrees C. It's, um, it's a voluntary set of agreements, mostly because of the U.S. Senate. But um, it is, it's, a, it's an important framework. Out of that framework and those agreements came the report last October on one and a half degrees C of warming. That was one of the mandates out of the Paris Climate Conference. And that had a huge impact. And the countries will get together uh, in a global conference every couple of years. Uh, I don't know what the frequency is, might be two or four. But they will hold each other accountable um, and keep pushing to make more and more improvements. Um, and that's what's needed because the current level of uh, commitments out of Paris is only going to get us to about 3.8 degrees C of warming. Not nearly good enough, so we've got more work to do. So what's happening uh, in the United States, because President Trump announced that he wanted to take the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accords, is that the um, effort is moving to the states and the cities. And there are now 23, as of today, states that are committed to uh, following the uh, precepts of the Paris Climate Conference. Uh, Nevada joined uh, the list of uh, the Climate Alliance today. Um, New Mexico joined within the last uh, month. Uh, and Wisconsin, I think, and Washington joined within the last month. So um, as the result of the 2018 election uh, have their impact in state legislatures and in governorships, we're seeing that effect. Climate mayors, there are 400 cities in the United States where the mayor, including the mayor of Albuquerque, has committed to following the climate accords in addition to what the mayor of the governors are doing. So that's hopeful. In the courts, there is a very important lawsuit called Our Children's Trust, or Juliana versus the United States. It's a, it's a group of a couple of dozen youth plaintiffs that are basically um, accusing the United States of knowing about the dangers of climate change for more than 50 years and not acting. They've continued to pursue reckless and dangerous fossil fuel development <coughs> of their health. We, they are demanding a national climate recovery plan. Um, and that, that lawsuit is proceeding forward. Uh, it, they keep trying to dismiss it. It's gone to the, the Trump administration has tried to push it out of the courts and the Supreme Court a couple of times. It keeps getting bounced back and it's proceeding. This needs to be nurtured. Good stuff. And these are some of the solutions that they're pushing. I think I'm running low on time, so I'll keep going here. But uh, <laughs> I'll make these slides available to Athena. Maybe you're going to post them somewhere. So we've got another well, five minutes. We've got five minutes. Okay. So other activism uh, efforts that are going on worldwide. There's something called the Extinction Rebellion. Anybody here heard of the Extinction Rebellion? XR? Mm -hmm. Follow it on Twitter. It's enormously exciting. It started in the United Kingdom. These are people committed to direct action, which means they will take a group of people and super glue their hands to the doors of parliament buildings and government buildings and prevent people from entering. They're shutting down bridges in London. And that is an action that happened uh, in New York City just uh, about a month ago, where a group of people got together in Rockefeller Plaza and hung the statue, on, hung the sign on my grandfather's statue and did a die-in right in Rockefeller Plaza on the ice rink. Um, and then in London, two days ago, they came outside of Parliament and poured buckets of blood in front of 10 Downing Street, saying, you've got to do something. It was These actually their red paint. Hmm? <laughs> it was actually red paint. Yeah. I, well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but but it was supposed to be blood. It's and, it's, and it's more permanent. And then there's Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Thank God for Greta Thunberg. Uh, she's a Swedish 15-year-old when she started doing school strikes for the climate outside of the Swedish parliament. It is now a global movement that has been taken up by young people striking and not going to school on Fridays. Um, she appeared uh, before the, the most recent um, climate conference in, uh, in Poland uh, and spoke to them and said, I don't want your hope, I want you to panic. I want you to feel the panic that I feel every day. 
And so there's actually an event in Santa Fe this Friday. If you want to participate, Fridays for the Future is their hashtag. Yeah, and that's it right there. It's on. It's an event on 350 New Mexico. If you want to share it, so there it is. Climate strike. And then there's the Sunrise Movement, a group of young people, uh, mostly out of D.C., um, who are doing some tremendous organizing, un organizing other youth. And uh, they did a sit-in outside of the Speaker of the House uh, office, got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to help them publicize this, demanding that the Congress commit to the Green New Deal, commit to urgent climate action. Good stuff. And the Green New Deal itself was introduced um, uh, in this uh, session in the U.S. Congress, H.R. 109. It is a broad, tremendously um, uh, ambitious program that commits to 100% clean renewable energy by 2035, net zero emissions, zero emission passenger vehicles, uh, fossil-free transport cuts methane levels, <coughs> promotes reforestation, restoring wetlands, far-reaching changes that connect energy, transportation, housing, and construction. Um, it is enormously, uh, it is enormously ambitious, but it is just as ambitious as it needs to be to solve the problem, which because we have waited so damn long, it is so late in the day, there is no way to avoid tremendously damaging effects. This might limit it to um, something that can happen, or something that we can survive. The uh, advantage of it is that it is not only um, a solution that is on the same scale as the problem, but it is also a super energizing I idea that will get people that don't normally turn out to vote to come to the polls and elect people that will save their future. So that is its dual mandate. The Green New Deal is cost effective. This is a study just published by good old Mark Jacobson out of Stanford University did an analysis of what it would cost and the benefits that you get uh, as a transition to 100% renewable energy. And he makes the point that there is a big price tag, but the price tag is no different really than what you're already paying on your electric bills. You're already paying to build big power plants. We're just talking about shutting down the old ones and building new power plants, which we always have to build every few years anyway. And so this trillion dollar, nine and a half trillion dollar capital cost within 30 years um, is part of the normal spending that we do to just maintain our electric system. So let's talk about some things quickly in New Mexico. Um, the most exciting, I think, thing that's happened uh, recently is the uh, Ener uh, Energy Transition Act, which is a way to both uh, implement the really strong renewable portfolio standards for renewable energy and electricity in New Mexico, paired with a just transition solution to uh, help the coal mine workers and power plant workers that are in the San Juan area right now and will lose their jobs as P&M shuts down that power plant, which has been their plan, 40-year-old power plant in 2022. And the good news is that it um, when we started working on this a couple years ago, we thought we could be super ambitious and get to 80% renewables by 2040. But um, Governor Lujan Grisham came in and helped negotiate it further to a 100% zero carbon standard by 2045 um, for the big utilities. And it passed the House of Representatives in, the, in New Mexico this afternoon. So it's headed to the governor's desk. Yay. Yep. Great news. A really quick question on yeah. that. Yeah. Is that fast enough? Um, it is consistent with what came out of the Paris Climate Accords. But it's consistent with the 50% by 2030 um, and uh, carbon neutral by 2050. So it would, if we were to do it, if the rest of the world matched us, it would keep global warming to somewhere between one and a half degrees and two. Is it, is it fast enough? It might be faster than we can build. We'll see. So these are all the great things that the Energy Transition Act does. Um, you know, it provides uh, tens of million dollars for economic development in the Farmington area, uh, sites, um, a renewable energy power plant uh, in that school district, district to replace the tax base that will be lost 
and the coal plant shuts down, does a number of good things. And this is the vote today by 43 to 22. Um, and it puts New Mexico among the national leaders for renewable portfolio standards. Uh, California <coughs> and Hawaii, the only two states that are committed to 100%. It puts us on par with that, which is great. New Mexico is number 12 in wind, number two in solar. This is another version of that uh, Mark Jacobson power chart uh, for renewable energy. And this is what it looks like for New Mexico with the uh, reduction in energy demand, the health savings, the land usage, and the cost <coughs> impacts, all of which are positive. Um, and it uh, would require, according to my analysis, of spending somewhere about $178 million of investment in the capital to build those wind turbines and solar panels over every year for the next um, you know, 30 years through 2050. The Union of Concerned Scientists did a great study uh, to analyze what would happen to the economy of the state of New Mexico as we do this transition, and their conclusion was it drives billions of dollars of investment, cuts carbon pollution 85%, 2,400 new jobs, no increase in electricity rates. You can find that study online. So this is a solar and battery solution that might be put up in Farmington, put out by Synapse Energy Economics. They did that study uh, just earlier last month. And there, just to wrap up, there are some other really cool climate and energy bills happening in the state legislature besides this one. Community solar, um, uh, renewable today. energy services, solar tax credit, uh, improving the um, powers of the oil conservation division to enforce um, uh, their mandates on methane emissions, home energy efficiency, really good stuff. I really look forward to seeing what passes out of this legislature because it's a new day. And that is my wrap. So we know more today about reaching 100% renewable energy than President Kennedy knew when he made this speech in 1962, and we landed there seven years ago.